Welcome back to the Colonial Antcast. Today's episode, we tackle the taboo of the hobby. I'm JB, aka The Colonialist, and joining me today are these ant keeping legends. I'm Hood from Ants Hood. I'm Jake from My Living World's Ants. And I'm Alex from Ant Holifer. Starting off with the subject of native versus exotics, an objective look across the board of this massive taboo. Well, I think European countries are some of the only countries where keeping, like, where it's another thing like we have the winter time like in america they of course also have the winter time but america is so large that somewhere it depends, yeah, it depends what state yeah, somewhere in. there isn't and somewhere there is a hibernation and somewhere it's almost like african species how hard it is and so i think it is really only europe that really can say no okay. i don't think it is because if, no, if no, you it's think not about like, like it's not like it's not, i don't mean like that but it's in general europe can say it all over the place in america it's lost like yeah depending from state well, to state. Yeah, well, I think the principles are still the same. Um, if yeah, you take course. native species, it doesn't really matter where you are in the world because if you take Australia, for example, I'd imagine they've got really stringent import rules about uh, ants and everything. Um, so an exotic species to them may potentially be getting the Lagius niger that we've got over here very common. So, you know, I think it doesn't matter where you are in the world. I think the native to exotics is still the same principles. But for here in the, U- in the UK and Europe, um, as a general rule of thumbs, uh, there's... Did, which are common ones to be fair and let's be honest most of the oldness we uh, we tend to is northern hemisphere people anyway or people in, in temperate climates so the rules aren't as strict i mean america is different because like you said america is so big isn't it um that they have to have they've got rules for each for each uh, state is it i don't call yeah. counties do they it's states well it, state. it, it, so it goes very from much like... state to county to town to city each one of them will have a different take on on it like even say like you're going into a state yeah, but then a county has a certain species of ant band and you travel through that county and you get caught you can be <laughs> <laughs> well i don't think it's right that we start with uh, natives anyway just because it's what we're all used to now as i've said before it doesn't really matter where you are in the world because um, your native species is going to I mean, if you're from like the Philippines, you've got loads of native species in Europe, not so much. But generally speaking, I think the rule of thumbs are generally going to be the same with some exceptions for difficult species. But I think that they're really beginner friendly because you don't massively need to worry about climate per se, uh, because the ants already acclimatized to your local environment. So you don't need to worry about that. Um, They're generally readily available and they're generally fairly robust in my opinion, anyway. I mean, I think they're quite beginner-friendly no matter where you are in the world. What do you guys reckon? I agree. Yeah, it really depends on what species, but, I mean, I think every country has a beginner-friendly native species. Like, in the Philippines, they have crazy ants, but they also have calm ants, so... Yeah, they like to keep Campanotus nicobarensis as a starter colony in the Philippines. Yeah. I mean, also, in lots of, like, places across Europe, um... There are some species of ants, native ants, which do hibernate. So the only the only possible downside is when people are keeping native ants but not realizing they hibernate, so not doing enough research. And, you know, if they keep them in a warm climate, you know, obviously there are some ants which don't have to hibernate, even if the majority of them do. Yeah. But generally, yeah, there are some species of native ants which still hibernate and people don't realize that sometimes. And this is what I don't get as well about the community, um, because some people seem to get really defensive if you've not hibernated an ant. And I've noticed it a lot on the forums and on YouTube and stuff like that. People seem to lose their minds because you've not hibernated um, a, a Lagos Niger, Niger or, 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 or Mesa or something. Do you know what I mean? I don't yeah. get that mentality. I, I, I really don't, because we're supposed to be helping each other. A lot of the time, I think it's just they don't have the correct information. It's kind of like the argument that I always bring up, which is the difference between Myrmica, which are a species that have overwinter brood, um, you know, uh, hibernation for them is actually beneficial. And it's actually how they progress further into their stage of um, maturity as a colony and mesors, whereas If they're found in southern Europe, they hibernate purely because the climate gets too cold. And where they are in North Africa, it doesn't get cold enough. They don't hibernate. And there's actually no benefit to them hibernating. It's purely a colony choice. And that's one thing that I always do. Now, I've lost colonies from forcing hibernation and 
not looked at the signs and not seen that they weren't ready. And I've lost colonies from not hibernating them because, again, I missed the signs that they were ready for hibernation and I didn't follow the procedure. So a lot of it now I look at is down to the individual species of ant. I do a lot of research into what they require. Do they have a beneficial system from hibernation or is it something they do as a survival mechanism? And there is a difference between two species that do that. Mm. Yeah, that definitely is. Every time we have this subject about how hibernation, I'm sitting here like, <laughs> I haven't hibernated my Mimica rubica only. Just, just because it's in a big formicarium and I just don't yeah. quite know how uh, to do that. You're completely, <laughs> yeah, I, I agree because I also didn't hibernate my Mimica rubica only. They're in a big, you know, natural setup and they've actually thrived because their winter brood, I, I looked at the bottom underneath and... You know, there are three piles of massive brood and, you know, they've been eating constantly. Their activity slowed down a little bit in December because I generally kept my room slightly colder. But, yeah, same. you know, I kept it maybe at not more than 20 degrees ever. It was maybe like 15 to 17. And they hmm. seem to be perfectly happy with that. But that so doesn't mean that your that queen hasn't gone into deer pause and that the brood hasn't gone into it over winter. It, it may still be going through that process, even yeah. though that you find the workers are active. I mean, hibernation mm. isn't a total shutdown of the colonies. Many of the of workforce course. will carry on as they would, but they slow down. They have longer sleeps because normally they only sleep for a, a couple of minutes. Then they'll do like, you know, yeah. 12 minutes work. Then they'll sleep for a couple of minutes. And this happens over a 24 hour period. But what they do is uh, over winter is they sort of have longer sleep. So you'll see less activity, but you will still see activity from certain workers in some colonies. Yeah. So, for example, yeah. this this colony has about five or six queens. I'm actually unsure. But I've noticed that two queens regularly come out to feed and the oh. others, I never see them. It's always the same two queens because... Isn't I, it I because they have closely. subordinate queens? Yeah, so it could be these two queens are either infertile and acting as workers, or yeah. they're just they're just the active ones. But yeah, there are definitely a few queens that haven't been active at all. Well, they have kind of the um, the two queen system, don't they? They have the sort of uh, the alpha and the beta. I, I can't remember yeah. the actual scientific yeah. term for them, but they have the larger the alpha, which will always remain in the nest, and then they have the beta, which is actually the system they use for colony budding. So what yeah. they'll actually do is send out those workers, the, the queens that act as workers, they'll send them out with the workers. When they find a new nest, they actually establish the nest and then the alpha queens are moved across. Mm. Yeah, and I have kind of the same thing as Jake with my room being a little bit colder, just to go back to the hibernation. And I clearly saw that my colony really slowed down, or at least I didn't quite feed them that much. And it, they, it looked like they slowed down. And now where we had a lot of snow here in Denmark, I had to turn the heat up a little bit because it was just getting crazy cold. And that also meant that the ants would get a lot more heat. And I can clearly see that now they are all over the place and exploring. So I think they have been a little bit in hibernation, even though the, the temperature hasn't been dropped more than five degrees. Yeah, well, they're very reactive to the environment when they're going through hibernation. It's not it's not a black and white subject, and that is a big thing about it. It is quite a grey area to understand and all the different behaviours that you can see and how they will take advantage of warmer days to get food for the colony if they can. Yeah, and this is also a thing like that's keeping exotics is another completely different thing because, like we said, the room is getting colder just because it's getting colder outside Whereas my other colonies that are exotics, I'll have to heat them more to keep up the temperature. Whereas my native colonies will just kind of go in a little bit in hibernation, though most of my colonies are in a fridge right now. Yeah, yeah, most of mine are in the fridge as well, to be honest. Most of my natives, anyway. I didn't end up hibernating my uh, former Karufa Barbis just because I got them so late in the season and they were still fairly active. So I just kind of like left them at room temperature, uh, which is higher than it should be at the moment actually uh, looking at it so i didn't hi hibernate all of my natives um but generally speaking apart from them i think they're all in the fridge to be honest but i am noticing um, some activity i keep popping honey in there every so often just to keep them give them some energy as it were but uh, other than that yeah they're all in the fridge but then again i think that's the only negative side to keeping natives in in, in colder climates more temperate climates because 
it kind of pushes people towards because it pushed me towards exotics because yeah. in winter they all hibernated and, and had nothing to play with as it were yeah yeah like three four usually. months break yeah yeah and that's and the when... truth is is that in my man cave sorry um in my, in my man cave which is now dubbed the ant cave as it were um <laughs> i mainly uh, was mainly in here during winter uh because in the summer i'll be out in the garden i'll be playing with my cars and um, playing with my, my mountain bikes and breaking arms and stuff and um you know and i wouldn't be in my man cave as much and in the winter i'd make my models and i'd uh, be in here more and i wanted to see them so that's why uh, i ended up moving towards getting my uh camponotus nicobrensis and we all know how that worked out <laughs> <laughs> insane yeah, but that's that's also a thing like ants cannot he's always said like we're getting to hibernation and it's the natural break for ant keepers who live in colder climates and for me it is nice to have this natural break But that was the main reason why I lost my hobby two years ago when I initially started. Because when you only have native colonies and they all just stop, it's just the first month is good because then you have like this quiet time and then you just miss the ants a little bit. And I think that's really, really the downside of native ants in the colder climates. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for But me, I love the routine I'm in when I'm at home. And I'm able to get for them, you know, that that the sometimes that five, ten minutes break from life, you know, you know, when life gets too much, you've got your hobby that you love and you've got yeah, exactly. five, ten minutes a day just just checking out the ants, you know, doing a bit of maintenance for them, doing a bit of filming of them and appreciating them. It's just that nice escape. It's like a meditation, I find, because when I'm, when I'm record, not just when I'm recording, but when I'm doing work and I take breaks, I often just get zoned out i just stare at the ants and i zone out and then i realize it's been 20 minutes half an hour and i've just been watching them uh, yeah the first thing and the last thing i do every day the first thing yeah. i do when i get up in the morning is go and check my ants to make sure I'm <laughs> yeah. yeah i do the exact well, that's same another thing, thing we should that's another thing we should talk about because um when people are keeping ants obviously as ant keepers we have to recommend you only check on them once a week or a few times a week They're depending the on the age yeah. of the colony but you can check yeah. on them every day as long as you're not literally causing big vibrations and they're only exposed to light for a very short period of time that's a lot that's a thing that a lot of people don't understand well, that it's always works really you have a, a separate yeah. nest to your outworld or you have yeah, of course. a setup where you can play about with the outworld without affecting the nest so that the queen can yeah. still just chill and do what she does because when the colony gets to a certain size your interaction primarily is with all the workers in the outworld that is where you interact with your ants and that's what i always try to explain to people you know that that first bit of patience pays off because the amount of interaction that you get later on mm. i have to say something i have recently got a nova mesa cockerelli colony yeah. and even though they only have eight workers they are just my favorite colony by a mile <laughs> yeah. i have to heat them up uh, and give yeah. and therefore i didn't want to heat up the test tube so i gave them a founding nest and in the outworld because i didn't, then i connected that outworld and that colony it's crazy how much i can interact with them even though it's eight, uh, eight worker colony i can give them frozen flies seeds and everything and they just take it that is <laughs> that's i'm so i'm so surprised by it because i have a i have a lot of colonies and all my other colonies they kind of chew at it when i'm not looking but never really dragging it but nova mesa cockerelli they don't really have a big social stomach so they have to drag it if they can drag it and that's so amazing because every time i give them something the next day they have just taken everything in the nest and i mean my, I, i very rarely see my mess uh, circulators They they'd never come out of the test tube um, at the moment. Well, very rarely. And if I do, I very rarely catch it. But uh, they seem to be doing well. From my last video, you can see they seem to be doing all right. Right, but they're just. I think I'm just so concerned about disturbing them because they're super sensitive messes. To, they're just pains in the bums. Um, but yeah, they're so sensitive. I just don't want to disturb them. So I just kind of like leave them to it. I've got an outward attached to it where they've got if they need f food and stuff if they need it, but they don't need honey water or anything, do they? Because they eat the seeds. So I just leave them to it, but I never see them. <laughs> That's um, one thing I was going to ask you guys. What's your yeah. rules on... You know how everyone says, right, you keep them in the test tube yeah. till they've got enough workers to move into a nest. But what isn't explained a lot of the time is from when your queen has their first worker, you can connect up an outworld which will make it a lot easier to not disturb yeah. the queen. As in long the as the outworld is usually a dry dry setup, just for the reason that they don't move into an outworld too early. Yeah, I, I just um, keep it plain and simple when it's when it's a founding colony. Yeah, you know, I, I don't yeah. evaporate it, I don't do anything. I, like I don't even, I just have a <laughs> completely empty outworld for the young colonies. So yeah. it's just a plain out 
glass or plastic or whatever. Yeah, that's, you know that's, what? how, that's how people can it's a valid point, though, to be honest. Found in colony. It's a valid point. A lot of people just assume you keep them in a test tube and you feed them in a test tube where, yes, you do, but you could also attach a small outboard to it. And, you know, and we don't, people don't talk about that enough, actually, do they? Because people always say, oh, don't move them out of the test tube and it's time to move out of a test tube when, when you feed them, they attack you. And that, I use that as a rule of thumb. Somebody asked me that question the other day, actually. I do use that as a general rule of thumb. But after saying that in, in the chat with them, I then thought to myself, well, none of my test tubes are really just test tubes anymore. They've all got outwards attached to them because it's easy to feed them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, that, that's how you. Them and you don't disturb them. Well, that's how you increase the amount of maintenance that you can do because you can interact with your colony on a weekly basis then, but you're not disturbing yeah. the queen in the test tube, which that you can check on once a month or, you know, every two weeks if you're that impatient. So, I mean, I, I tend to do it every 14 days to once a month, depending on what the queen is, what species, semi claustral Claustral, claustral. Mm. Yeah. Well, I, I I will definitely really a topic for another video. But like I do some small experiments on my channel, and I think next year I'll try to do like I don't know eight queens and put one queen in a test tube and one that is dark and one queen in a test tube that it's had light and then a small nest without light and a small nest with light, just to see how much different there is. I know from one colony to another colony, it, there can be a huge difference, but just like try to put this to the fact and see how massive is the difference. Because I saw a video with the ant network, I think his name is. Yeah. And he says yeah. he has all of his non-sensitive colonies in light every single day, all day long, because then they get used to it and then they don't care. And I'm thinking like, is this just a myth that they, uh, of course, I, they don't like vibrations. No, it's but not. Like, I did this. I did as this long thing. as the light is constant, that's the main yeah. thing. The light has to yeah. be constant 24 hours a day and they become, they then see that as normal light. Yeah, I've done that with one of my Campanotis Lignoperda queens and she's got a ton of brood. Like it, the larvae aren't quite big enough to pupate yet, but they're a fairly good size and she's been doing really well. Well, I think we should maybe go back to the main topic of exotic versus natives. And I have a big thing that is good with native colonies compared to exotics is that if you are in the situation that you want to release your ants, like uh, JB has often talked about, it isn't a good thing releasing your ants either way. But if you're in the state that you have to release your ants because you're moving and nobody wants to buy them, that is the really big thing with native ants that you can do that without having massive consequences to the local ecosystem possibly yes yeah, very point yeah, yeah po possibly of course uh, if you have I mean, a mate the, the thing is as well you could just be uh, 90% of the time these colonies don't survive being thrown out into the world because of how they prepare to move nests or how they create nests and also the parameters if you notice in the wild you won't find ant colonies with they're always within a certain distance of each other whereas when you throw them out in the wild they don't know what this distance is. They're all out of sync and they're just open to a million predators. So, yeah. you know, sometimes it's actually kind of to just let them pass in the, in the refrigerator because all you're doing really is putting them outside to what could be a war zone to them, which yeah, for, they get picked sort of off one by one. Survive, there there, there is a potential they can survive, but the chances are slim when you look at sort of ant survival in general, unless it's a roving colony, like if it's something like Murma Karuba and they move all the time, they obviously have a higher chance of success. Not only that, they can defend themselves because they, they have a stinger and they can apply venom to their threat, but something like Lazius Niger, which is likely just to die from the shot, let alone anything else, yeah, just and, from and the for change. And for people that don't quite understand how ants want, yeah, for ants that can't live outside the natural form or not outside the formicarium, you can think, think of it like a zoo. If you have a tiger that makes a baby and then that tiger gets grown up and makes a baby, these all these tigers have been used to getting food from the zookeepers. So that tiger, if you release that into the wild, it won't know how to hunt for food because all its life and all the previous tigers in that zoo haven't really hunted. And I think that is something you can compare with releasing some ants to the wild like a lazy species. Certainly, mm. they do get lazy from being fed by their owners, and that's normal. That yeah, exactly. Any, and that any is just the same with the planet is affected that way. Of course, of course, they they do lack the survival skills that 
the wild exactly. colonies would have gone through. They would they would have a completely different system of survival compared to a wild colony, which already puts them at a disadvantage. And if you think about it, the wild colonies around them will already be often bigger, stronger, you know, so if they get raided or it, you're just putting them out to too many unknowns. And in a way, I think it's just kind of like that third party murder, you know, you you don't want them anymore, but you don't want to be the one to do it. So you're just going to put them out and let the wild do it. But that's kind of cruel in a way. Yeah, it's like throwing a kitten outside a, a, a car. Exactly. It, you know, you, you know the chances of survival are slim. <laughs> no, it's not like that. It's not like that brutal, like throwing a kitten outside a car, but it's but, the same But principle. why don't we think of it that way? Because people don't yeah, exactly. see insects on that same level. But no. these are pets. We're keeping them as pets. They should be respected as pets. You wouldn't do that to a kitten, so why would you do it to an ant? It may be yeah. an insect, and you may not value it the same, but it still has value. It's still right. a I'm creature. Gonna, I'm going to play devil's advocate here, then. How about feeders, then? Because we we breed them. They're technically, we look after them. They're technically our pets, but then we cut them up and feed them to our ants. I mean, so, yeah, the way I you do see, it. I'm just playing devil's advocate. Yeah, and then, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, totally no, I understand that. That's, that's true. I mean, we, I but, keep... Sorry. So, like, obviously, I keep um, roaches, locusts, mealworms, sometimes other things. And obviously, what I do to try and to try and make it as ethical as possible is I feed them so well. I give them enough space. I make sure their conditions are just right so that they live the best life that they know. Because, obviously, insects don't have a conscience. And because of that we see them as less worthy from animals, but you know, we're still killing those animals, giving them as like almost <laughs> offerings to our ants. But it's, and, it's the same, it's the circle yeah. of life really. It's, it's the same know, for humans very and, that and we just... farming with animals. And I'm the same yeah. as you, I try to give them the best life possible as a feeder food so that they are given that respect. They are fed well, they are on a good diet. They do live a good life right up until they're fed to the yeah. ant colonies you know which is more than you can say for humans and farming cows or pigs or chickens because we're I mean, you cool. know they're like electrocuted to death you know exactly. decapitated well, i'm gonna be yeah again i'm gonna take a different point of view on this <laughs> one um even though i do well feed my feeders um i give them a variety of stuff apples carrots and whatnots and stuff so they are well fed um i generally don't look after them that well in the arts. I just stick them in a tank, feed them, and then pick them when I want them kind of thing. Yeah, and the reason why I do that is because I don't want to get too attached to them. Because if I get too attached to them, I'm not, then not going to use them for what they're for, which is feeding my ants. I'm going to be like, I don't want to... I like that ant. I like that cockroach or because I keep cockroaches. <laughs> no, I, I like that roach. <laughs> I'm, not going, I'm not going to kill that roach. I found myself doing it before. I was being a bit more selective about what I was taking from them. Because yeah. mainly because I was wanting them to reproduce and I was keeping all the adult females so they could mate and produce eggs so I could get the nymphs so I could feed them to my starter species, um, my foundation species. So, But I was, I was being more selective about what I was taking. So, but the point, that's, that's my point though, isn't so, it? Yeah, is I, I can't start... quite get attached to cockroaches after they attacked me when I was in deserted regions. By their hundreds yeah, of thousands, you. yeah. Wake up with them trying to like in Saudi Arabia, out in America, places like wow. that. I've had them trying to crawl in my mouth, up my nose, like tugging on my eyelid. Oh, it drives me crazy. Damn. So oh. I, I will never have an affinity with the the feeder foods that I keep for my ants. They are clean feeder foods. But then again, that's what I mean about how humans sort of we decide the value of these creatures. But I and again, think we decided that, to keep ants. Again, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's that whole cycle, though. You know what I mean? You're always going to value your pets more than you are what you feed them with. I mean, another you thing know, is, if like, you have a pet it? cat and you've got a, a tuna fish, which one are you going to yeah. value more? The, the tuna is <laughs> going into the dinner plate, not the cat. I mean, I've never eaten cat before. <laughs> <laughs> when we're feeding live feeders, I mean, you know, to the ants, I mean, there is a certain ethics put in place because, you know, if you crush the head of an insect, you've essentially already disable the insect to the point where it's starting to die and once you've crushed the head or chopped the insect up the only reason it's moving is just 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 because the nerves are being exposed and you know yeah. these ants yeah, because it has a ganglia system. yeah exactly and what people don't realize is once you've crushed the insect or chopped up it's not alive just because it's moving and that's a, the one of the biggest misconceptions and people well, get really what people you know, don't realize is humans do the same thing if you take yeah, them out quick exactly. enough they often twitch yeah. I was just about to say that. Because if <laughs> yeah. you chop a head off a human, like it is noted that back in the days, humans would still twitch as well if they were like hang or cut the head off or something. 
Yeah, it's, it's just how the nervous system... Let's not get just, too morbid, people. It's, it's just, <laughs> el- it's just elect- No, but it's biology. It's just electrical systems being charged yeah. into the nerves, which causes a twitch. So one of the things there is with keeping exotic is that they are maybe invasive and can maybe invade into your country and do stuff like that. But even though we don't get invasive species into the country, some species still just have a very rough time. A good example of that one would be the... Uh... Formica rufobarbis. Now, I acquired a colony of these myself just after hibernation started, hence why I've not actually hibernated them yet, um, or this 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 year, should I say? I did a lot of research into this one because, uh, as I said, in my uh, on my vid- uh, on my video that I did for YouTube, which was the uh, taboo ant, because people get quite defensive yet again about the rufobarbis because in England they are protected. Now, there is no set. I can't say this word. Legislation. 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 Legis- that word. There, there's no set one to look after this particular ant, but they are literally down to two to four, I believe it's two now anyway, um, Connolly's left. And after that, then on mainland UK, that's it, they've gone. Now, they're very common in, in Europe, um, and the paper, which I did tag into my, tag into my um, video, did state about potentially um, introducing some Rufy Barbies from other areas to boost the UK population because there wasn't a massive amount of um, genetic differences between the two. But I don't think they had the budget or didn't get the money. Um, I don't know or whatever because I've had I couldn't find any more follow up paperwork. Bear in mind that paper was written in 2010 and there's not been any follow up paperwork that I know of paper uh, about it. So I'd imagine it never happened. Um, so. I'd love to get in contact with somebody that does know about the Rufy Barbis and what, what the conservation efforts are. But I think if ant keepers like ourselves do keep them, uh, if they ever contacted me saying you've got a colony, do you mind giving it up? I'd happily give it up to the, it can be reintroduced into the wild. But yeah, that's my point. On it. I think that we can keep natives as well to help boost the local population, because if they come to natural flights, um, why not release them and give them the opportunity to form a natural, um, a natural colony somewhere? That is one of the pros of keeping native species. That's the only time I'd say it's okay to release is when your colony is having a nuptial flight and you've released the unmated males and females out into exactly. the wild to join wild colonies and to boost local populations. Because then by keeping native species that are able to do that, you, you're actually helping your local ecosystem. As long as, like I say, those species are found regionally where you are and there's another colony that they can sync with and and mate with on an uptill flight yeah i mean that's definitely yeah that's definitely a point because um as ant keepers you know we love to catch as many queens as we possibly can and the people who sell ants you know they want to catch hundreds even thousands and a lot of people get very aggressive and angry about catching too many and affecting the local ecosystem, which is possible if they collect too many. But then at the same time, if it, there are it, ant keepers like us who are releasing ants from, from nuptial flights, we're just giving back that balance. Yeah, it is a give and take. And I think that's how you should look at it in, yeah. in, in every way. And also you need to look at the species and how they have a nuptial flight. Like there is no way on earth that you would decimate Lazius Niger with their nuptial flights because they populate in the billions. They can be tracked from space. And I don't know if you yeah. looked yeah. at last year's satellite tracking. It was it was insane. Ridiculous. Most, of, most of them ended up out in the North Sea. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah. It was so, a news was in a... Denmark that <laughs> ants were flying in, in the UK. It, it happens yeah. every year. If I start to look out for it, but um, I think it was 2009 that I saw the first report of them tracking it by satellite and you can see the clouds i mean they they spanned miles i mean like over my allotment um back in summer i was out there when nuptial fights were happening and this was just a flavus believe it or not lassis flavus i've never seen such a big um flight um there were also some lassis nigers honestly the sky went slightly dark it was like there was a cloud and i just That's walked cool. around and it was like raining ants but obviously <laughs> upwards and I, I just couldn't believe my eyes it is quite incredible when you get caught in the middle of a, a nuptial flight swarm. Yeah, and you see it's like the, the shimmers of all the wings, and it's just oh, it's amazing. Not so nice, as, nice if it's murmur because I can get quite. <laughs> <a bit cool. laughs> I've never noticed their nuptial flights once, only once. So the thing about murmur carubra um, and probably other native ants with a similar genus, murmur carubra don't tend to fly the same way, which is what JB said earlier. 
that you have to really research how they have nuptial flights because Momo Karubra are also able to have very short flights and mate near other nests that, that are very close and yeah. you know sometimes they don't even fly at all um i've noticed that definitely because my colony when it was slightly smaller the males were mating with some of the some of the queens on they the are a species soil. that can mate within the nest yeah so, and that's well, part I, of their colony body i think there's a thing that we also need to talk about um local species because countries are pretty big so you can find species <laughs> like in Denmark. Denmark is uh, four islands, three three islands. So that, yeah, it's big, it's pretty small. Yeah. But still, some of the species we have hundreds of kilometers away. We don't have here where I live because that's just how it is. So that's, even that's what I was talking about, sort of regional, where like you might find some ant species that are up north in Scotland, in the UK, for instance, but they're not down south in London. And that's what I meant by like, if you bring, although it's native to your country, it's not native to the region. So it all depends on what I call exactly. on how orthodox you want to be about native keeping. If you get really, really strict, yeah, then really you shouldn't be keeping any species that's outside of a mile of where you actually live. Yeah, exactly. And that's some of the things that people on the internet, like being mad at people keeping exotics, that's a pretty big argument towards them as well because i'm pretty sure that if they have bought just one colony that is that is native are yeah. you sure that you have it in your area and but again that's why i it's said that it, it's hard because there's a lot of misinformation out there and of course yeah. you've kind of got that sort of blanket response that that was kind of i don't know i call it like the um the ac bible really like he laid out yeah. you know that statement so of true. this is okay this isn't okay but people don't do any research past that or they don't they're not educated in the subject past that and they don't understand that it's not black and white and that you no, need to actually really do a lot of research into it to understand it it's, it's kind of like again like the hibernation aspect like it it's it's just a, a really gray cloud and you can go down so many different avenues you can get lost in in all of the information that you need to take in but then again i yeah. think ac's got a lot to answer to on that one because he 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 has kind of created it's come from him essentially isn't it the native team native team team exotic arguments yeah. come from yeah. him um and i don't think it's a valid argument to be fair providing i, you I know think what it's doing. more come from um the american culture and sort of north america canada countries where they have quite strict laws on it so we don't have been from the uk and europe and places like that we don't have that stringent control you know we, we're, know we're, what... we're very flexible so we have a very different culture about it and i've heard if... what you're saying but i've still had arguments with people that are you from the uk where we've got the relaxed laws that are still preaching yeah but the then, but then they're, they're that's where i'm saying they're not edu educated on it because they don't understand the local laws they don't understand the difference they don't understand they're taking on the culture from what they've seen you know it's kind of like you know kids growing up in london watch too many american films and now they think they're american gangsters you're not like yeah. do you know what i mean you're not living in south central la like it's completely different and if you went over there you would actually realize how different it was but it's that kind of aspect of they just don't actually understand they're just taking on the culture without doing the research and they're not experienced enough to know the difference and that's exactly sorry, I really one of the points like the Bel -Air then. <laughs> sorry i couldn't help myself you know when you hear it just like start singing the french prince and west philadelphia <laughs> born and raised <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. I'll, I'll go, we'll go back on topic. I just couldn't help myself. <laughs> but I mean, uh, that's also one of the things. Like people saying you can't keep invasive species because they are invasive. Well, here, here in Europe, we have a thing called winter. And <laughs> I, I don't know if you know winter, but it's pretty cold <laughs> for a colony that needs twenty to thirty degrees minus yeah. minus degrees. It's pretty cold for these yeah, colonies. I was gonna, I was gonna like actually mention that. So there are obviously different levels of not just native ants, but exotics too and moving on maybe to exotics now like yeah when people are keeping exotic ants there are obviously different levels of ants and i don't know but exotics seem to have a much larger variety of different types of ants and specialities that's and, also the thing like exotics yeah. is worldwide exactly it's every ants like and they're always the common there are always the common exotics that everyone keeps. But the problem is when people keep exotics that aren't really heard of or there isn't enough research or information, 
and then they just die. So this is this is a very big thing where people keep yeah, exotics and they those, die. Those people are the pioneers. I mean, if if you look at the um, hobby and sort of myrmecology as a subject, yeah. most actual research has come from keepers who have yeah. kept like blogs and studies. They've they've got little known species, and they are the researchers. You know, lots of people who who keep documented forum posts on on their colonies. You know, day in day out, a lot of those species have been undocumented in the wild, even or or just. Yeah. Yeah. not study so like a lot of information of their behaviors and stuff like that actually comes from people in the hobby who are sort of pioneering that aspect i mean if you look at the famous colony of leaf cutter ants that used to be in the natural history museum it was it was a professor who kept them and when the colony got too too large he donated them to the museum a lot of the stuff that he studied on that was released and that was just from ant keeping yeah and that's also just the thing like levels as, so, as soon as you get a colony that isn't native It's exotic, yeah. like here in Europe. If I get a mesobalbus, it's an exotic species. But then again, people don't get crazy mad if I get a colony from Europe because, well, it's, it's just true. a Europe colony. But if I get a yeah. colony from America or, or Asia, Philippines, or yeah, Asia, like that, people get completely upset. But what, what is the difference? If get but that it, that falls into the education of when people think of Europe, they don't actually realize a how big Europe is. Like it's it's kind of like saying. You know, I'm gonna compare like the state of California to the state of Washington, like completely different terrain, completely different species of ants, and you find that same spectrum across across Europe. But because it's blanket Europe, everyone just imagines that you know the ants can just cross borders or they live in the yeah. whole section. They don't they don't divide it up into all the little areas. Like it's even in the UK. We do have invasive species, but they're invasive species from Europe who can hibernate as well. Um, mm -hmm. You've got various Lazius um, invasive species at the moment. I mean, there are several invasive species that are taking hold and are causing problems. The thing is, when you get into the tropical exotic, that's where you're safe on the fact of if they get loose in this the section window. of the world, they're gonna they're gonna die because they just don't have the ability to hibernate. They don't have the ability to survive in the cold and exactly. they just can't. Even in our summer, that can often be temperatures that are too cold for certain species. Yeah, or maybe not too humid because they need rainforest and stuff like that. Yeah. But then again, you got to think that um, playing devil's advocate, because I've been doing that all day today, um, <laughs> you've, got some, you've got some invasive species that will quite happily live in a house that's heated and stuff like that. This is why, even though I, do, I am team exotic, I still tend to avoid the most invasive, like um, feral ants, for example. I won't, I won't go near them because the pains, because they can escape red fairly easily because they're just escape artists, and they're quite happy to set up a, a nest in my house. Now, yeah, I, I, I don't, don't believe ants all over my house, to be fair. I don't believe in keeping species like that. Like I kind of have like a sort of threat rating. So when when I look at the research, yeah. the, the species that I want to keep, I look at the risks of what will happen if they did escape. Like mm. I, I'm happy with keeping species that like say they escape, they even if they did take hold, even if like say they took hold for a summer, the damage is so localized because they're not going to last. They can't reproduce. There's no other colonies that they can bud with. You know, hobbyist keepers that that do lose colonies or release colonies that they shouldn't release, they often don't cause much damage because those species can't carry on Mate. to procreate. You know, that a lot of that stuff comes in through the trade and we get blamed for it. You know, it comes in through the industrial trade. It comes in through the agriculture trade. It comes in through, you know, all that kind of stuff transported, you know, by big, massive companies that just aren't checking their stuff. And okay, yeah, customs has got a lot stricter over the years now that we actually take into consideration our, our ecological impact on the world. Yeah, but it's just an, a whole nother thing. Why are people so mad at keeping exotics? Like all these invasive species that are invasive all over the world comes like from the 1800s where big ships had hundreds yeah. of different queens and then just yeah. sailed it across the world. And then people are getting mad at I get, I'm yeah, that, getting that's what one I mean queen. before, before yeah, exactly. goods were looked. I mean, if you look at Solenopsis, they've been traveling the world for 160 years on human yeah. commerce. You know, um, yeah, the Argentina right. ships and again, stuff like that. That 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 started getting shipped around the world during World War Two when people started um, trading with Argentina. Yeah, and we also have like, if you think about pretty much the majority of pets that we keep, I mean, a lot of those animals are exotic, and people don't frown upon that. You know, like keeping a budgie or something, or a parrot, or you know, there are many But animals. Again, which... that whole that whole stigma does really stem from. The AC 
Bible. I mean, that's one of the like quite strict strict I think codes should, on I there. Think I think we should say one thing. When whenever we say AC, we are referring to Ants Canada for all of those listening yeah. who are confused. <laughs> AC is Ants Canada. I apologize. AC is Ants Canada. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not trying to bash the guy. I'm not because I've always said his channel has merits, but there are certain things that I think should be addressed and. You know, um, people but who that... take his side on it, I would love to hear from them as well. I'm happy to hear their argument, but most people yeah, but don't do the thing. research into it or have the understanding of of how they take hold of where the problems come from. So as as long as people do the research, I think they most people have a different opinion on it when they've been keeping ants for a long enough time. They start to differ from the mainstream view of, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that. Those quite rigid rules that have been set in place in the in the hobbyist in in the hobby. I mean, it's not just yeah. Ants Canada. There's several other uh, large YouTubers who are on the same bandwagon, but. I also understand their point of view. You know, Ants Canada at the time was in Canada where they have laws that say you can't keep exotics. Um, Ants Australia, you know, they have a massive problem with invasive species. They've got a very delicate ecosystem. You know, it's not just ants. They're just strict across the board because they get decimated by all sorts of problems that affect their crops and their, and their livestock. So they have to be very careful. So I can understand how they, they took that stance, but they, they take it from a very demographical view. It, it's from their point of view it doesn't include the whole world yeah, exactly. so you find people from uk and europe being quite alienated by that view because we have a, a different culture and a different system and that's also the thing like owen where ans canada is living now in the philippines is another thing from for him to take a solenopsis colony and release it because there's a big chance that that colony will survive and be invasive whereas if i release it, it it's more dangerous for me to release a misopapyrus because that Mesopotamus might survive the winter and might survive survive. Yeah. So it's really just depending on where you're from. Like I get if you're in the Philippines and have a lot of invasive species there, that would be dangerous because they can thrive if you have like Philippine species and all the tropical well, species. Should, subtropical species are very different, especially like you know, like the yellow crazy ants. They're they're known for being like a super pest when it comes to subtropical climates. Anywhere they they can get where it's sort of like tropical, they can take hold. And that's what's yeah. happened in the Philippines and Australia and stuff like that. So you do have certain species that can plague their environments that they have to be careful of yeah sorry i'm just watching my ants excavate the chest cavity of a mouse sorry <laughs> mouse which species is this my ever crazy uh nicobarensis oh this is another thing we can talk about actually um because obviously with keeping exotic <laughs> ants there are many species where eat small mammals, not just insects. Because most native species of ants in the UK and Europe don't tend, they do, but they don't tend to go for larger animals in most cases. Oh, they'll pick up a bird hard. carpet. Yeah, but you know, like roving ants, for example, a lot of their prey is larger. Yeah, yeah, and that's also a live prey, right? Because, I mean, yeah. all the ants will go, go after dead prey. But, I mean, here in Europe, I don't think we have a lot of species that will deliberately attack a live. Maybe Mimicaruba mm -hmm. will attack small salamanders or stuff like that. But Maybe during, like, maybe to defend their nest. Yeah, exactly. Go back to that. When you've got a large Connolly, it just doesn't cut the mustard feeding them cockroaches. So that's why I've moved on to pinkies and now fluffies because because they're so big and that they're quite ravenous, as it were. Yeah, I, I think you have to say what pinkies and fluffies mean. Just, just <laughs> yeah, pink, sorry, a pinkies a baby mouse, so it's not got yeah. fur, so it's pink, so hence pinkies. It's the smallest mouse you can get, and a fluffy is like the next size up where it's got fluff, where it's got fur. Um, so you're like for all you for all you ant keepers that are keeping you know snakes. It's basically stuff, you know, reptiles. Like the thing about that you can say that, but if you look at the protein content in a cockroach compared to the protein content in a fluffy, you'll find that the cockroach actually has a higher protein content, so it is actually a a better source of food. But the problem is you'll end up feeding your colony if it gets large enough, like six or seven large Madagascar hisses, to start feeding their appetite, and it does become easier to feed something like a a mouse and it is good to have that change in diet as well that change in in varied meats and stuff yeah, like that yeah yeah i quite agree i mean i occasionally get mario worms um and give them that as well just to chase up the diet i still give them cockroaches mine they still yeah. have about six large road roadrunner roaches um a week at least if not more oh. and uh, maybe once a week once every uh, one to two weeks i'll give them a fluffy 
So they, they do have that very diet, but they're still on the, the roaches anyway. They are they're a species like the... that will strip a body in the wild anyway, if they come yeah. across it. <laughs> yeah, well, they strip these pretty good, to be fair. No, it's, it's the easiest way to keep up with the protein requirement for a large carnally like this. Um, that I'm probably touching 3,000, if not more. Um, they have, they are, the queen's definitely a dispause, um, as I explained in one of my last videos about Monaco. So uh, the, the development's going to st- slow down, even maybe even decrease until the summer. But I think when the summer comes along, it'll explode again. I mean, Campanotis well, nicobarensis are a very popular exotic ant because they're like a level in between harder exotic species and still, you know, I, I find they're like one of yeah. the beginners. Like, if yeah, you find, definitely. If you go to like where they're found and speak yeah. to keepers there, they they all say, yeah, we start with Campanotus nicobarensis because they're the equivalent to Lazius niger, but they yeah. grow on steroids. <laughs> In all yeah. fairness, I do the exact same. When everyone asks what the good beginner species is, I always give a native and an exotic. And my exotic is always nicobarensis because they just they are relentless. I think what they, they did. I've come across a lot of people that constantly ask me advice about them and I always give my best advice that I can. A lot of it's just really looking at their outworld and the setup of it as well, just to make sure, tweak it a little bit to make sure it's, it's better. But I always advise it. They are difficult to get started, but once they kick off and once they've established, then wow. Much like the polyacus dives as well. Slow start, but once yeah. they get going... They just explode, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I have a colony that is that state of not going. I have a Campanotus floridanus colony. And all my larvae die before they're going into pupa stage. Oh, no. And I can't tell why. I mean, the queen... Uh, well, it's a Campanotus species, uh, so... Mm, I'm not true. quite sure how much, it's, how much it depends. They're around 30... Uh, I watered like once. Though. Yeah, that's uh, what I thought. So I've started watering a little bit, but I'm I'm just thinking like most Campanotus live in like most people say a Campanotus don't need to be watered at all, so therefore they can live in a. Their, their nest doesn't need to be watered, but they need to be provided fresh water all. Yeah, time. they have they what have fresh water. Is, they have a yeah. test tube and a, a drinking. Um, liquid feeder so they have a lot of water they'll, source they'll fill up their gasters and take the water back and then they'll coat the brood or the young in in the water so that's kind yeah. of like what they do they'll sit there cleaning the eggs you see them but what they're also doing is hydrating them yeah mm-hmm. i think i think my problem might be uh, vibrations because that's the only thing i can really say i mean the heat is perfectly at 26 degrees and they have to be 26 yeah, to that sounds, 30 that sounds good and the queen, since I got her, I fed them flies and whatnot, and her gaster is completely exploded. It's <laughs> so big now, and I can't, I can't tell what's going wrong. I can only think that it's vibrations. It could be My campanite paresis is very ago. much the same. She's super sensitive to vibrations and being disturbed as well. I mean, I've had her for well over a year, and she's thrown only about 25 workers, but she's just super sensitive to any disturbance. And it might be the same situation, maybe. I mean, I've just left her to it now, and she started laying more eggs. But just leave her to it. Yeah, uh, but I'm not doing it at all. I, th- I think it might just be because I'm going. Uh, if uh, now where I'm back at work, I don't really enter the end room that much. But I have to go past them when I get it in the door. I have to go over to my PC, and beside my <laughs> PC is the end colony. So I don't know if that's enough vibrations. I- I'm just, I'm just kind of getting lost. Thing is, it's it's hard it to go through the checklist yeah. trying to figure out what the issue is, and you know that's yeah. that's that's a lot of what this hobby entails. I must say, you know, yeah. And then sometimes, as we out. discussed last week, you can't. Sometimes queens just ain't cut, cutting the mustard and just yeah. will not survive or ever get big in colony size. You know, it's one of those, it's one of those things. Maybe, maybe, maybe I've got a dud, a dud, dud coin for my uh, paresis. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Like you said, we said it last time, you can do everything perfect. And for some reason, yeah. it's not going right. There's no way you can sort of. Yeah. And that's how inkeeping is, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And it's important as well that people know that. As we said last week, that it's not always you. I mean, if you if you've got if you've had like twenty five queens and they all died, then I'll probably say it's you. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. but if you lost like but five of, of the twenty five, that's probably yeah. natural reasons. I'd say yeah. a good yeah, third then... is even is even an average amount probably for what people like people's losses for ants. I've got a question for you guys. So how long into ant keeping and at what point did you start your journey into exotics? Like at what point did you decide to break away from the mainstream and sort of... Literally a year and a half for me, I think it was. I think I, I went through my second hibernation was when I was just like, well, this is boring and I want to get an exotic ant. <laughs> I've got to say it was actually my first year. Um, How was it? I 
think so, because I definitely well, kept Lassia species, Myrmica. I think my first was, it was actually, it might have been my Campanotus nicobarensis actually, funnily enough. I think I first got my official late, like exotic ant this year in uh, yeah. late 2020, but I got my Mesobarbrus colony was the second colony I ever got, though they died a bit later. But that is, I guess, an exotic species or whatever. Yeah, that's <laughs> so, that's I mean... what introduced me into exotics. Is kind of I got back into ant keeping from someone who never had the, the internet back then, and I only kept native yeah. species. And of course, I watched Ants Canada like everyone did, and I was like, yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll stick to Team Native. And then <laughs> yeah. I started buying native colonies. I was keeping them, and then I got offered a Meso Barbarous colony. So I was like, yeah, why not? I always see them posted up. Everyone has them. They must be native. Looked online and was like, oh, they're exotic. <laughs> what's this world yeah. of exotics and then i sort of stumbled into the world of exotics and i do say like one thing about exotics if you're going to go into it then commitment and respect for what you're doing it is 110 percent what you need to do you know it's like it's like a puppy don't get it just for christmas it's the same with the ant that some of them can live 15 30 years exotics you know if you can't keep them if you can't find someone else to rehome them to then you know sadly you're going to have to take the responsibility to put that colony down just for and i'll just like to say that uh, if anyone wants to rehome any ants get in contact with Hood and they'll see what you can do <laughs> <laughs> I, I always say the same thing if i have the space and i can take them i will or if yeah, i can find too. someone that will take them because I think any of us would really <laughs> that that's but, my uh, but that's my ethos when it comes to sort of releasing as well my belief is once captive always captive the yeah. responsibility has to go somewhere so it either goes to a new keeper or it rests on your head to do the best for the, the greater good as they say but I, I think i have to say something in in comparison to ants canada i think he's one of the main reasons my why I really many people get fire ants the solenopsis the solenopsis yeah. and I think that's actually a very bad thing because solenopsis are crazy growing as soon as they like get a grip and just and escaping. So, you know, like, yeah. you need super escape prevention. For yeah, them. and even yeah, though but... he says they are hard to keep and all of that, I think so many people like I have gotten a lot of messages Same. like people say asking why don't you get a solenopsis like the Ants Canada? I was just sitting like I don't. I, I'm not like JB. I don't like the the <laughs> thing about looking at being scared of your answer every day. So, so I mean, I the, the thing is, I do. But then again, like um, from every point of when I go into that aspect of keeping them, it's not like ants kind of right. I don't have an open setup where I'm just relying on the barrier. These are closed lid setups. They're designed to contain them. They're designed yeah. to provide yeah. the, the best environment for them, but also to make sure that I don't have any escapes. And that's part of what I meant by taking the responsibility. It's nice to go, oh, yeah, I'm going to have this fancy fire ant colony, but I'm not going to put the work in to make sure that they're safe, that they're secure, that they're not going to escape, that I'm 110% committed to their care and their needs, no matter how big they get, that I can financially support this colony through the cost of upgrading their housing, through the cost of feeding them because they're a high protein feeding species and that always means that you're going to have a higher cost in feeder food and when you think about you know 50 cockroaches for 30 quid and say you're going you've got five or six of these large colonies that means you can be spending 30 pound a month just on feeding them i mean yeah, yeah very true but then again it's okay not to overfeed your colonies if you have a certain size that you like you can just start feeding them one roach a day or whatever and then they'll yeah, just but kind then of you say that keep... if, if they've got like 1200 larvae sitting there like um you know a yeah, yeah. This queen can lay 1200 eggs a day so i i i dread to think what my carabara are laying they they must have about 5000 eggs a day so they've roughly got about 5000 larvae to feed so if i cut back on the food i'm actually damaging the colony because it has a natural growth pattern that i have to keep up with there's a, there's a certain amount of numbers that need to be fed and that's a lot of the thing you have to weigh up how much food you 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 need to feed the colony for their health i mean you can go 3 4 days after they fed without feeding them because they they the way they eat is they they have their food they consume their food then they need a couple of days fasting after they've they've let it all out otherwise your yeah, workers can suffer protein poisoning and stuff like that from where they're holding on to it and it's it's decaying inside them and they haven't yet fed it to the colony so it is really about sizing your food to the colony but a colony like that will always take large amounts of food and that's yeah, but I, I have a argument that i would like to hear your answer what, what about wild colonies because they don't always have a food source and i think they will still lay but then that's the thing. Eggs a day. 
yeah, but then they'll suffer because their their workers won't be as big, they won't be as strong, they won't have enough food to divide out, and most of the time that can be the demise of the colony. If you look yeah. at the um, BBC documentary on the honey pot ants, is it the Empire of the Deserts? Yeah. Uh, Empire of the Desert Ants. Yeah. So yeah. Empire of the Desert Ants. So at the very end of that, if you paid attention, the colony that they followed for two years actually died out because they was 30 foot too far away from the water source and there was another colony that was bigger and stronger that had had more food that yeah. then just went and raided them and killed them because they had the food source and that colony didn't so it did well for two years and then suddenly it faced the drought and that was it that was yeah. the end and that's how delicate it is out in the wild and that's again when people are like oh they're, they're wild they should be kept and you're saying well I keep them you actually do keep them safe and that's an example of how you as long as you match what they need they're in a safer better environment and they will survive whereas in the wild they may not have because I mean, that's it's like happens. it's like when you know when you're keeping ants in nests that require hydration for sponges um or cotton or whatever choice of material you use you know there are always going to be those ant keepers that will go away for a week and forget to top up the water you know it dries out and then the ants die so it's yeah. not necessarily about feeding the ants it's also about the water because a lot of people don't where well, they can go they... two weeks I'd without like feeding to say they can go four days without drinking exactly exactly i think i think that's crazy how people can forget that i know it's yeah. maybe maybe some of you have done it but in my eyes but... I completely panic if I have to go on a vacation. Like, oh my god, my yeah, aunt and I, I get really water it, and I give them ten bottles of water and update their <laughs> you know, protection like system. And, in that world. and the I, thing like, is, I, I think this is more on, on, the, on, on the low scale side of it, not when you're like planning a big trip away, but like even yeah. if you're just going away for a few days. And sometimes you can get caught short. I mean, I know in the beginning before I I knew the different rates that that different um, hydration areas would yeah. use up. You know, if it was just a small bit of cotton and I put it in, I knew that by the end of the day with the heat cable there, that would need to be rehydrated so that I have certain ports that I need to rehydrate every day. And yeah. I've got certain ports that I don't Same. need to hydrate for a week or they've got a test tube system so that they don't need to be hydrated for a month because the test tube will hold a month's worth of water. Yeah. yeah. But that's the thing also about like keeping exotics. If you're in Europe and you have to get a high humidity, you have to, like I have uh, my Novo as a cockerelli i have to water them every second day because of the heating mat and that's just how it is so if i go on a one week vacation or two week vacation they will dry out because they have a 27 degrees heat mat heating them up all day long so and they need to have a 60 to 80 percent humidity and they're down at 40 if i don't water them for three days and then i'm just like damning yeah so it can also so, affect humidity yeah so that's also a thing getting into ant keeping and getting into exotic species from a it, european it, or a cold it's funny because keeping ants is so much more about learning the environment like you yeah. become part geologist part <laughs> um other insects <laughs> environmentalist, <laughs> do, do you know yeah. what i mean you become everything because you start monitoring all these different things and then then you yeah. learn about bioactive material bioactive setups and learn about ecosystems all the different species <laughs> yeah you, you, you basically yeah. start designing through sort of i don't know stumbling through the dark really as you start designing your own biological systems because you start yeah. adding in the balances so you start adding in you know cleanup crews different insects so you've got one cleanup crew to clean up after the ants then you've got another cleanup crew to clean up after that cleanup crew then you've got <laughs> yeah. something to decompost anything that's going wrong with the soil because you need to look at soil health or you know substrate health to make sure that isn't getting moldy and being overrun with fungus so there's a lot to it yeah so obviously with ant keeping um a lot of it is experimental and especially when keeping new ant species for both new ant keepers and old ant keepers it can be very frustrating sometimes and you just have to work it out it's a lot of experimentation yeah in general it's just checking off and like doing experiments with heating do experiments with humidity there's a lot of fact on the internet but in when it comes to most of the things you have to do for your own colony because one colony likes it like this another colony likes it like that and therefore you have to do yeah experiments yeah it is and um, i mean that's often where it can go very right or very wrong as well because you know i've uh, my campanotus nicovarensis i know that's come up a lot in this in today's topic but my colony likes it on the hotter side of what it's re recommended to be at whereas i know a few other colon people that have colonies have theirs at sort of 24 degrees c whereas mine's at sort of 28 29 degrees celsius but that's what my colony likes. yeah and i think you know when we when we come on to the next episode this is this is the topic we're going to be talking about yeah experimentation with ants and 
experimenting within the ant hobby and the world of knowledge that you have to get your head around just to sort of understand all the niche points to make it work okay well as always we have covered a vast topic and we've gone off track as famously we do but we are running out of time so we're going to bring this to the end of the podcast so from myself jb the colonialist until next time i'm signing out and i'll leave it to the others to say goodbye bye for now bye for now goodbye yeah that was good yeah i think that yeah, that I think okay. that that will be how it is. <laughs> <laughs> It'll work. <laughs>